Welcome back, everyone. We're so honored to have the esteemed Dr. William Walsh with us today for the entire hour. He's an author, lecturer, and teaches physicians about biochemistry and how nutrients affect the brain. Dr. Walsh received his PhD in chemical engineering from Iowa State University, and in 2008, he founded the Walsh Research Institute, a nonprofit based in Illinois. Dr. Walsh is the author of a new book called Nutrient Power, Heal Your Biochemistry and Heal Your Brain. Thank you so much, Dr. Walsh, for traveling all the way to Texas well, to be pleasure. with us today. It's my pleasure, and it's great to come place a little bit warmer than Chicago. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Walsh, for joining us. Uh, how is it that a um, chemical engineer dedicates his career into the workings of the sick mind? How well, did this happen? Give us a little background in your life. Well, I got very interested in nuclear science and nuclear physics as, as I was going through getting my doctorate in chemical engineering. And actually, I've never f really functioned as a chemical engineer. And uh, I worked at places like the Institute for Atomic Research in Ames. I worked at Los Alamos. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I got interested in trying to find ways to make nuclear reactors safe, and nuclear power safe for Americans. Yeah, yeah. And as a young scientist at Argonne National Laboratory, I got interested in uh, volunteer work. Back in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, it seemed like everybody I knew was, um, there were people going to the Peace Corps and volunteering sure. and helping people. And uh, there was a woman in my neighborhood who was murdered in a terrible incident in Joliet, Illinois. And, I got motivated to, I decided I wanted to see if there's anything I could do with respect to crime and violence in this country. Mm -hmm. And thinking about it, I thought if, if, if I could do anything at all, the, the way to do it would be to go to the people most likely to commit a crime. And those are people leaving prison. Yeah. So I became a prison volunteer. And at Stateville Penitentiary, one of the three toughest prisons in America. Yes, sir. And uh, as I was doing this, uh, people would come to me and say, hey, Bill, I hear you're going to the prison. Can I come too? And within a year or two, I had a, a volunteer group of 125 people doing, wow. working with some very tough people. Yeah. And we were doing the usual naive things that volunteers do in prisons. But we learned that if you're really going to help somebody, the time they need help is when they get out of prison. Yeah. To do what you can to help those who want to, uh, re, you know, reform to, uh, you know, to, to, to make it. When it's not, a, it's not a good thing for a, a criminal ex-convict to be hungry and homeless. No. These are dangerous people, and they yeah, know no. how to make money fast. Yes. So we were doing that, and I got to meet, my education started when I got to meet the families that had produced a criminal. And, um, you know, when you, when you visit a prison, that's one thing, but it's a lot harder when, you, uh, when you're working with ex-convicts because they might show up on your doorstep with a suitcase, yes. and they, they have needs. Well, uh, I found out that there were many wonderful families that had produced a criminal, people from... Uh, you know, the suburbs with uh, caring families who had other brothers and sisters who turned out well. Mm -hmm. And this one child seemed headed for the penitentiary by the time they were born. And the mothers especially would tell me about how uh, they knew there was something wrong before the child was six months old. Yeah, They would try to cuddle this little baby and the baby would push away. Mm -hmm. Some of these, I heard uh, of two-year-olds who were uh, torturing in, in a couple of cases, murdering the family pet and oppositional and defiant, uh -huh, and uh -huh. they would have family counseling by the time they were four, mm -hmm. medication by the time the child was six years old, and very often institutionalization at eight or nine, and the family said they felt they were headed wow. for the prison by the time they were born. <laughs> at, at this time in the 60s, maybe early 70s, yeah. compare the established medical attitude towards mental illness, um, schizophrenia, criminal behavior with what was the frame of mind in those days? And, and it, it, it holds over to today, too. It does, and it, it actually, that is a very key issue. Uh, yes. it, mental health is going through a, a big revolution right at that time. And the, <clears throat> prior to that time, if, you, if a person had anxiety or depression or, or a mental illness, uh, the thought was that it was caused by your life experiences. And yeah. you would eventually find yourself on a, on a psychiatrist's couch where they would be delving into your early lifetime trying to understand what went wrong to cause this problem. Mm -hmm. Well, the revolution was, it's called the biochemical revolution in psychiatry. And right at that very time, they were finding out that, the, that there was an inborn predisposition for, for these problems that they ran, they ran in families, and the twin studies and adoption studies were just changing the whole, the whole uh, field of psychiatry. And uh, in a very short time, people stopped uh, going to the psychiatrist's couch, and, and they realized the problem had to do with neurotransmitters, 
uh, receptors and the, and the biochemistry of the brain. Now, you've, you've done some research with autism, and there was a time when autism was thought to be the result of a cold, distant mother. A refrigerator parenting. mother, yeah. So life experience again. Yeah, and that was a complete disaster, and, and it was wrong. Uh, they believed It's very unfair to these poor families that have had this tragedy in their lives. One of my supervisors at Argonne uh, was a wonderful man, and I found that he was quite depressed, and his wife was quite depressed, and he had a 16-year-old autistic child, and he said that their depression started not only when they realized their son had this, this disorder that was going to compromise him the rest of his life, the finger of blame was pointed right at them, and, yes. and they, he truly felt that they had caused it by not loving and caring and nurturing the child enough. Oh, and it was yeah. all so wrong. It was really quite evil. Yeah. And, um, and it went on for about 40 years. So this was the prevailing attitude towards uh, most all forms of mental illness was life experience, hands you a raw deal, and yeah. you're not very good at dealing with it. And, and that's what changed us. Yeah. We began okay. to realize that we didn't know why these people were violent, why they were in prison. And the question became, what's the cause of a, of a behavior disorder? What could have caused them? So be, working at a scientific organization, uh, Argonne National Laboratory, a national laboratory, um, I decided to see if I could find chemical differences in them. Well, yeah. what gave you that idea? Well, I delved into the libraries when I realized I didn't understand what I was doing, that our volunteer group didn't know what was the cause of a behavior disorder. Yes. Uh, I just studied everything Study. I could about mental health. Uh -huh. And, and it, I realized it had a lot to do with brain chemistry. And I wanted to find out of whether violent people had biochemi brain chemistry abnormalities. So I started doing experiments. I started collecting blood samples and urine samples. And colleagues of mine at Argonne would come forward and say, hey, I've, I've got this neat equipment. I can do chemical studies. And mm -hmm. we were just, we had you, no funding. It was great not having government funding or something. Well, you could call the what, shots then. It was wonderful. And so we just did these really, mm -hmm. I think, really classic experiments looking for differences in criminals compared to others. Wow. Okay. There's a, a growing field of nutritional medicine. And... <clears throat> Whether you realize it or not, you've had a prominent hand in the development of this nutritional medicine concept over the years. Uh, contrast nutritional medicine's approach to the old style of looking at mental illness. How is this new approach different? Well, the, this approach is, is, I think, going to be the new era of, of mental health. And I we went through the, the early era of thinking it was all life experiences and, and people needed counseling and that kind of work. To, and now we're in an era of medication therapy, trying to adjust chemicals in the brain and, and, and neurotransmitter activity, mm -hmm. and, but using foreign molecules to do it. But now brain science has advanced to the point where we can, we are right on the threshold of a time when we can normalize the brain, realizing that where do our neurotransmitters come from? They, they, they are, the brain's a chemical factory and all day, every day, it's nutrients, are the, they are the raw materials that, are, that we so get these Prozac, chemicals from. Prozac is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Yes. And you're saying that nutrients could essentially do the same thing. Well, we have now identified, based on recent science and epigenetics, we, we now know what nutrients are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Mm -hmm. For example, methionine, an amino acid, uh -huh. and SAMI, acetinosyl methionine, mm -hmm. which is a popular uh, over-the-counter nutrient, right. they are quite powerful serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And no one's ever tested low in Prozac. <laughs> No, right. <laughs> no, no, they haven't. Now, Prozac and antidepressants have helped many people, mm -hmm. but they don't help everybody. But they yeah. harm some people, too. They do harm people, and as my book, Nutrient Power, uh, uh, describes, depression is not a single disorder. Mm -hmm. It's a okay. collection, it's a name given to a collection of completely different disorders. Uh -huh. But medical science and psychiatry today uh, has the misconception that depression is virtually always low serotonin activity, mm -hmm. and it's not.